Okay, good afternoon. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah, no. yeah Okay. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Experiments in the Humanities, sponsored by the Center for Cultural Cultures today are the kickoff event for the CCA's major program this year on evidence and explanation in the arts and sciences. In the broadest sense, our program looks at the current state of the humanities and sciences, at the modes of investiga in investigation and research that characterize each, and when possible, at connections between the two. Our lectures today ask a common question around this theme. Simply put, how can methods of the sciences eliminate traditional questions in the humanities? Our speakers are uniquely qualified to answer this question. Both are eminent humanists and longtime leaders in their field, each a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, no less. Both have been advocates of bringing quantitative methods to humanistic inquiry from the experimental philosophy of Stephen to the distant reading of Franco. We can think of no better combination to talk separately and together about evidence and explanation in the humanities, about how and why to use empirical and, or quantitative methods in research on philosophy and literature. So we're going to, going to proceed as follows. Our speakers are going to talk one after the other We'll then take a quick break in the middle and move afterwards to a collective question and answer period. So I'm going to ask you all, therefore, to hold your questions until the very end of what will be, I'm sure, a lively and informative series of presentations. So moving on quickly to introduce our first speaker, Bob Matthews, professor of philosophy at Rutgers. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have a chance to introduce uh, Steve, who I've known uh, for many years uh, before he was, became a colleague here at Rutgers. He's the Board of Governors uh, Professor of Philosophy here. As you might expect, he's uh, published numerous books, edited volumes and papers, uh, which you might want to take a look at on his website. What I'd like to call your attention to, though, if you happen to take a look, is the number of these papers and edited volumes, and indeed the most recent book on mind reading with uh, Sean Nichols, uh, that are uh, co-edited, are co-written. One of the things that's quite striking, I think, about uh, Steve's research in philosophy is his success in adopting a model that's very common in the sciences, but quite uncommon in philosophy, namely a model of collaborative research. And I think it's a real virtue to, uh, of his work, and important as a model in philosophy, this idea of, in, of having collaborative research, particularly with your graduate students. Um, now, Steve's work, I guess, would be described as uh, philosophy of cognitive science, uh, pretty much concerned with philosophical issues that lie at the intersection of philosophy and uh, cognitive science. Uh, he shares a view with a number of us that work roughly in this area, namely of thinking that when you get to the questions that are of interest to philosophers, there isn't any bright line that distinguishes philosophical research from cognitive science, scientific or empirical research. Um, now, what's distinctive about uh, Steve's work? Well, I guess uh, when I think of his work over the years, I think of one of the striking things is his scientifically informed skepticism of many concepts and ideas that uh, most of us philosophers or even common folk would take for granted. In his 1980 book, uh, The Case Against Belief, he argued there weren't any beliefs. In some recent papers written in the 90s, he argued that there's no such thing as traits of character understood as robust, cross-situational, cross traits that would predict people's behavior. Uh, more recently, he's argued that there's no such thing as morality. This was the, co this was the topic of a series of lectures, the, the very prestigious Jean Nicot lectures that he gave in Paris a couple of years ago. So as I say, 
what you notice about this, it's a skepticism, but it's always informed by a good sense of what the empirical research in the relevant areas, uh, how it bears on these questions. More recently, uh, he's been one of the, if not the founder, one of the seminal leaders in this er uh, field of the, uh, this program called experimental philosophy, which I'm sure he's going to talk about today, which uh, has cast a, a critical light on a number of different areas in philosophy where philosophers, particularly under the influence of logical empiricism, have presumed that they're involved in some sort of a priori endeavor where they made use only of these a priori philosophical intuitions and the, the resources of logical reasoning. And what he's tried to do in collaboration with a lot of his uh, students and others is show that in fact the grounds of these supposedly a priori uh, practices are empirical grounds and you have to look at the empirical foundations of these philosophical inquiries. So I'm sure he's going to be a good Thanks, talk. Bob. <laughs> Okay, how, first of all, how's the sound? Okay, on, yes, working. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand over here for, for two reasons. First of all, uh, the screen's too small for me to see my own slides unless I stand over here. And secondly, uh, <clears throat> I've learned uh, from uh, much experience uh, that when I give a talk like this, I should stand really close to the door. Uh, because uh, you can never tell when I'm going to have to get out of here. All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking about issues in moral theory and from Plato and Aristotle's time to the present, um, moral theorists have made lots of empirical claims, claims about uh, <clears throat> the role of character in uh, fostering moral behavior, the role of reason in moral judgment, the role of emotion in moral judgment, the nature of moral motivation, uh, the sources of moral disagreement and the prospects of eliminating disagreement. I'll talk a little bit about that one a bit later on. The extent to which moral knowledge or moral belief is innate. Uh, the extent to which genuinely altruistic behavior is impossible. And a host of other issues as well. Well, in support of those claims, the great moral theorists of the past uh, have used the only sources of evidence that were available to them, namely introspection, careful observation of human behavior and history. But not surprisingly, those sources of evidence weren't adequate to establish or refute the quite powerful claims that these moral theorists are making about moral psychology. So most of the issues remained unresolved. Well, OK, let's fast forward. Uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. As we all know, psychology became an experimental science. and. By the end of the 20th century, experimental uh, psychology and various branches of neuros 